Part 2, The Word Shaker, featuring Dominoes in Darkness, The Thought of Rudy Naked, Punishment, A Promise Keeper's Life, A Collector, The Bread Eaters, A Candle in the Trees, A Hidden Sketchbook, and The Anarchist Collection. Dominoes in Darkness In the words of Rudy's youngest sisters, there were two monsters sitting in the kitchen. Their voices needed methodically at the door as the three of the Steiner children played dominoes on the other side. The remaining three listened to the radio in the bedroom, oblivious. Rudy hoped this had nothing to do with what had happened at school the previous week. It was something he had refused to tell Liesl and did not talk about it at home. A gray afternoon, a small school office. Three boys stood in line. Their records and bodies were thoroughly examined. When the fourth game of dominoes was completed, Rudy began to stand them up in lines, creating patterns that were round their way across the living room floor. As was his habit, he also left a few gaps, in case the rogue finger or of a sibling interfered, which it usually did. Can I knock them down, Rudy? No. What about me? No, we all will. He made three separate formations that led to the same tower of dominoes in the middle. Together, they would watch everything that was so carefully planned collapse, and they would all smile at the beauty of destruction. The kitchen voices were becoming louder now, each heaping itself upon the other to be heard. Different senses fought for attention until one person, previously silent, came between them. No, she said. It was repeated. No. Even when the rest of them resumed their arguments, they were silenced again by the same voice, but now it gained momentum. Please, Barbara Steiner begged them. Not my boy. Can we light a candle, Rudy? It was something their father had often done with them. He would turn out the light and they'd watch the dominoes fall in the candlelight. It somehow made the event grander, a greater spectacle. His legs were aching anyway. Let me find a match. The light switch was at the door. Quietly, he walked toward it with the matchbox in one hand, the candle in the other. From the other side, the three men and one woman climbed to the hinges. The best scores in the class, said one of the monsters. Such depth and dryness, not to mention his athletic ability. Damn it, why did he have to win all those races at the carnival? Deutscher. Damn that Franz Deutscher. But then he understood. This was not Franz Deutscher's fault, but his own. He'd wanted to show his past tormentor what he was capable of, but he also wanted to prove himself to everyone. Now everyone was in the kitchen. He lit the candle and switched off the light. Ready? But I've heard what happens there. That was the unmistakable, oakly voice of his father. Come on, Rudy, hurry up. Yes, but understand, Herr Steiner, this is all for a greater purpose. Think of the opportunities your son can have. This is really a privilege. Rudy, the candle's dripping. He waved them away, waiting again for Alex Steiner. He came. Privileges? Like running barefoot through the snow? Like jumping from ten meter platforms into three feet of water? Rudy's ear was pressed to the door now. Candle wax melted onto his hands. Rumors, the arid voice, low and matter of fact, had an answer for everything. Our school is one of the finest ever established. It's better than world class. We're creating an elite group of der- German citizens in the name of the Fuhrer. Rudy could listen no longer. He scraped the candle wax from his hand and drew back from the sp- splice of light that came through the crack in the door. When he sat down, the flame went out. Too much movement. Darkness flowed in. The only light available was a right rectangular stencil, the shape of the kitchen door. He struck another match and reignited the candle, the sweet smell of fire and carbon. Rudy and his sisters each tapped a different domino, and they watched them fall until the tower in the middle was brought to its knees. The girls cheered. Kurt, his older brother, arrived in the room. They all look like dead bodies, he said. What? Rudy peered up at the dark face, but Kurt did not answer. He'd noticed the arguing from the kitchen. What's going on in there? It was one of the girls who answered, the youngest, Bettina. She was five. There are two monsters, she said. They've come for Rudy. Again, the human child. So much cannier. Later, when the coat men left, the two boys, one seventeen, the other fourteen, found the courage to face the kitchen. They stood in the doorway. The light punished their eyes. It was Kurt who spoke. Are they taking him? Their mother's forearms were flat on the table. Her palms were facing up. Alex Steiner raised his head. It was heavy. His expression was sharp and definite, freshly cut. A wooden hand wiped at the splinters of his fringe, and he made several attempts to speak. Papa? But Rudy did not walk toward his father. 
He sat at the kitchen table and took hold of his mother's facing up hand. Alex and Barbara Steiner would not disclose what was said while the dominoes were falling like dead bodies in the living room. If only Rudy had kept listening at that door, just for another few minutes. He told himself in the weeks to come, or in fact, pleaded with himself, that if he'd heard the rest of the conversation that night, he'd have entered the kitchen much earlier. I'll go, he'd have said. Please take me. I'm ready now. If he'd intervened, it might have changed everything. Three possibilities. One, Alex Steiner wouldn't have suffered the same punishment as Hans Eberman. Two, Rudy would have gone away to school. Three, and just maybe, he would have lived. The cruelty of fate, however, did not allow Rudy Steiner to enter the kitchen at that opportune moment. He'd returned to his sisters and the dominoes. He sat down. Rudy Steiner wasn't going anywhere.